Okay, hi, we're gonna talk about prostate cancer options for diagnosis and treatment, as well as the work of Dr. Dean Ornish. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk about what I do, how I approach this clinical problem. And so there's always the medical facts, but it's also important to have a philosophy of how you perceive a situation. And that's actually one of the most important things. We'll talk about that a little bit as well, so that what you really want is optimal care. There's always a standard of care that's available to everyone, but an intelligent patient, you should seek optimal care because you want optimal results. All right, for the average guy, here's what typically happens. He's just at a routine checkup or for whatever the reason he decides to check his PSA, prostate specific antigen, and it comes back a little high. He's referred to a urologist. He's worried, okay, because he knows that could mean he has prostate cancer. The urologist will typically perform a random biopsy. So there's, they call it a sextant. There's six spots, you know, the right and left, upper, middle, lower. So they'll take two specimens out of each one with an 18 gauge, or they're not even sure the size of the core biopsy these days, but a core biopsy sextant is taken from the prostate. It's called a random biopsy because they just randomly biopsy those six locations. Um, they'll do two cores in each one, 12 specimens in total. And there's a risk of some injury to some of the nerves and the tissue in the prostate just with the biopsy. And the old uh, anonymous slogan is, when tumor is the rumor, tissue is the issue, cancer is the answer in, in medicine. The biopsy will often come back low-grade prostate cancer. But lots of guys have low-grade prostate cancer. You know, different, depending on what you read, one autopsy study says 50% of men have prostate cancer at 80 years of age. Another one says 70%. So it's real common to have low-grade prostate cancer. And it's actually usually not that big of a deal. They're not gonna die from that. It's more when it becomes intermediate and especially high grade or very high grade prostate cancer that there's a higher risk of dying from it. Urologists are trained to do surgery and their entire training has emphasized surgical removal of the prostate. So typically a patient goes to a urologist for the biopsy and then when the biopsy comes back positive, that's what urologists usually do is they recommend surgery. So one of the points of this talk is, yeah, sometimes that might be the appropriate treatment, but it's important to learn as much as you can about prostate cancer because you might not need surgery. Maybe you don't need to do anything at all. Maybe you can just do watchful waiting. Maybe radiation therapy is a better option. Maybe uh, androgen deprivation therapy is a better option. And there's other options. And one of the things I want to talk about here is what I see in the average person who doesn't know anything about medicine when they're diagnosed with cancer, they're sad, they're frightened, they're worried, all that stuff. But they also have this mentality, oh, I'm going to fight this disease, you know, and they've got this fight cancer mentality. And that's okay. You want kind of resolve. But what I'm trying to say is it's not like D-Day, okay? It's much better to analyze the cancer, to try to understand it, to study it. Believe me, I've dealt with thousands and thousands of cancer patients in cancer situations. You want to understand it and see what your true, real options are. You know, it took years for that cancer to grow, so you don't need to do anything tomorrow. What you need to do, first of all, is learn about it. What is the stage of disease? What are the diagnosis options? What are the treatment options? What would be best for me to do in my context? Who are the best persons to advise me, the best books to advise me, for example? So I joke that this is like the Fabian strategy. Back in ancient Rome, Hannibal, uh, the leader of the Carthaginians, was an incredible general. And every time he went face to face with the, um, the Romans, he just kicked their butts, okay? But they then got a guy by the name of uh, Fabius, and they let him be in charge. This is called the Fabian strategy. And he found that just by delaying the supply lines of Hannibal and refusing to engage face to face, the Romans were able to defeat the great Hannibal, okay? And so that's the same thing with cancer. You don't want to go head to head with cancer and, and do all kinds of crazy things you don't need to because there's a lot of side effects from some of these treatments. Um, you want to understand it and then pick the best choice, which will often surprise you once you really learn about it. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit here about how do you stage cancer. Anytime you get a cancer, you want to know what you're dealing with. So first of all, the PSA, prostate-specific antigen, is a blood test. And it can be up for other reasons. It can be elevated after sex, after digital re rectal exam. Um, it, it's higher when a person has a big prostate, which is very common in meat-eating populations. The prostate in a man is like the breast in a woman and the endometrium, the uterine lining in a woman. It's very estrogen-sensitive, hormonally sensitive, okay? Um, and people in this country are totally estrogen overloaded. So it's very routine for men to have a big prostate. You know, a guy over 40 or 50 will joke that he has to ask his prostate permission to go to the bathroom because it'll often cause a little delay in the urinary stream. 
prostatitis, relatively common infection or inflammation, nonspecific, that'll also elevate the PSA. Sometimes there's a lab error. So all of these things are relevant uh, with an elevated PSA score. Digital rectal exam, DRE, sometimes is part of the staging, the big finger feeling for a nodule in the back of the prostate, you know, through the rectal wall. A Gleason score. Gleason score is a very important component of staging prostate cancer. Low risk, you know, six or less. Those patients will almost never die from their prostate cancer. One researcher, Lawrence Quotes, uh, was uh, described as saying 97% likely it won't affect their lifespan. And it's probably higher than that. That was a little bit combined with some intermediate patients. Um, intermediate risk is grade 7. These are the Gleason scores based on the pathology, looking under a microscope at the biopsy specimens and the highest grade. Really high risk prostate cancer is a grade 8, very high risk 9 or 10. So depending on the Gleason grade, that's going to guide the workup and the treatment. Um, high grade prostate cancer, you'll see sometimes in younger men with a very rapidly increasing PSA, bigger tumor spread outside the prostate and whatnot. The vast majority of tumors are thought localized to the prostate gland itself. Metastases means to spread out of the prostate, so it can go to the lymph nodes, the seminal vesicles on the back of the bladder, can go to the bones. Um, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is sometimes helpful for the workup of prostate patients. It's, it's improved a lot. Usually it'll be done on a 3 Tesla. That means a powerful magnet compared to most magnets are 1.5 Tesla. And it can help provide some useful information. It can tell you if you're dealing with a focal tumor, more likely an intermediate or high-risk prostate cancer, versus a generalized, relatively normal-looking prostate, maybe some heterogeneity, which might suggest a prostatitis or a low-grade prostate uh, carcinoma, you know, grade 6 or less, Gleason. Um, if you see a focal mass, you might be able to do a targeted biopsy to it. More likely, you get a positive uh, biopsy. Um, seminal vesicle invasion can be demonstrated on MRI. Has it spread outside of the prostate? Has it spread to the local lymph nodes? Um, sometimes on follow-up, instead of a old-time protocols where they do a lot of random biopsies, you can follow up the patient with an MRI, which is a lot more pleasant than getting a random biopsy. There's now developing techniques with ultrasound that are not that widespread. Color Doppler can be placed on the tumor to see if there's blood flow. There's a new scan called the PSMA PET scan, which is sort of being developed that can show more small metastases. Okay, now sort of a new thing. In the past, it used to be almost entirely prostate cancer managed by urologists, but now there's some other doctor specialties that are helping out with prostate cancer. Um, in particular, there's some oncologists that have uh, more and more experience treating prostate cancer. This is a good book. It's called Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers by Mark Scholes, MD. He's an oncologist who specializes in prostate cancer and with Ralph Blum. Ralph Blum was a very intelligent patient who had prostate cancer and lived with it for many years, about two decades. And he died for other reasons, but he wrote this book all about the experience of understanding prostate cancer and what a man goes through. And I read it. It was a pretty good book. Okay, um, so here's a, just a couple of quotes by Mark Schultz, MD, co-author of the book Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers. Um, he said that only about one out of seven men with prostate cancer are at risk to die from it. So when a guy gets an elevated PSA or a positive biopsy, he's freaked out. He thinks, oh my God, I got cancer. I'm going to die. I got to get surgery tomorrow. No, you're probably, you know, six out of seven guys, they're not even going to die from it. Their real problem is most people die from coronary artery disease, okay? Um, that's, or cancer in other locations. Prostate cancer is like a slow-growing cancer most of the time. Um, for low to intermediate prostate cancer, the 10-year survival is almost 100%. Uh, more than half of prostatectomies are thought unnecessary in the opinion of this oncologist. Okay, uh, you know, urologist might have a different opinion than that. Radiation therapy is, in the opinion of Dr. Schultz, is thought is underutilized. He thinks that radiation therapy often works better than surgery does. Uh, the urologists will control the referral patterns. They did the biopsy, the patients with them. They'll often guide what uh, is the follow-up. And many patients just rush right into surgery without having thought about it that much. Um, Andy Grove, the famous computer engineer CEO of Intel, had prostate cancer, and he wrote about his experience. And one quote he had was, every bird sings its own song, that the surgeons would tend to recommend surgery, radiation oncologists to recommend radiation. So the wise move is like the old metaphor, you know, Five blind men and an elephant. One guy feeling the elephant's tail says it's like a rope. Another guy feeling the elephant's leg says it's like a tree trunk. Um, another guy feels the elephant's ear says it's like a rug. The point being is you want to study all the perspectives and then you can come to the conclusion of what's best. You kind of get a bird's eye view instead of the six blind men standing around the elephant. 
Uh, as we spoke about, MRI can help differentiate low-grade and prostatitis versus focal mass, more likely high-grade prostate cancer. So there's a list of different treatment options here. <clears throat> there's different types of radiation therapy. Intensity modulated radiation therapy, IMRT, is sort of one of the more modern, uh, more precise uh, ones. There's different types of therapies. Quite often, they'll rely on trying to lower testosterone, for example. They'll even, they even used to often do castration, which many people think is overrated, but that used to be a big treatment. It's still sometimes done. There's trade-offs to everything. With radiation, you avoid, you're less likely to end up incontinent, but there's still a pretty significant risk of impotence. You avoid uh, going through surgical anesthesia, general anesthesia, which sometimes can, you know, occasionally, rarely cause memory loss, but that's something you don't want. couple of points on surgery. The big thing that most guys are worried about is impotence. And you can even get things that are not quite impotence, but they still interfere with sexual function like climacteria, meaning that there's urine uh, exiting the urethra during sex. Incontinence is relatively common. You know, my background is I was an interventional radiologist. It was like an imaging guided surgeon. So I took care of lots of uh, patients with prostate related problems. Uh, most commonly just doing cystograms to make sure that they weren't incontinent post-operatively. But also, you know, I would see some occasional abscesses. Um, I knew one guy, he wanted to go to this fancy university and get the newest version of robotic surgery. And so to a patient, hearing words like robot and laser impresses them. That doesn't impress me. And what impresses me is a surgeon has done, you know, hundreds and hundreds of this operation, is really good at it, has good results. That's useful, valuable information. But a robot, how coordinated is a robot? <laughs> I want a surgeon with good hands operating on me. I don't care about some robot device. Are you familiar with like Moravec's paradox that the hard problem is easy, the easy problem is hard, meaning that it was easy for the scientists to make uh, calculators that could do calculus back in the 1950s and 60s, but they still can't make a robot as coordinated as humans. So, you know, the idea of a robot and a laser, these fancy words, don't be so impressed by that stuff. Long-term results, good outcomes, that's what really matters, okay? Um, rare, fistula between the urethra and the rectum can occur. Uh, pain in that area is no fun, that can happen. Sometimes they get in there and they realize the tumor is worse than they thought, they can't remove it completely. Good staging preoperatively helps to prevent that. Um, unknown metastatic disease, that's why you want everything staged. Oncologists in particular are good at staging stuff. Oncologists, it's like built into their brains. Cancer diagnosis, we must stage the disease. They do that automatically. Okay, um, epidemiology and the research study of Dr. Dean Ornish. Okay, first of all, a little epidemiology. Back in about 1957, I heard this in a lecture with Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, there was only about 18 cancer deaths from prostate cancer in Japan. Okay, that's an incredibly low number, incredibly low. And the Japanese, they're pretty healthy in a sense that they had relatively low cholesterol, but Japanese are smoking a lot of cigarettes, eating tons of salt, some of them up to 20 grams a day. So even if you're smoking a lot, um, if you don't simultaneously have a high cholesterol, you'll often have a lower cancer incidence. The salt gave them a lot of gastric cancer, but the point I'm saying is those are incredible numbers. And they're eating you know, primarily a rice-based diet. So that makes you think, maybe if I ate a rice-based diet, I'd be a lot less likely to get prostate cancer. Um, in the United States nowadays, typically about 30,000 men die every year from prostate cancer. About 200,000 men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. And the point being is the number of deaths and the number of diagnoses don't match, meaning that most of the patients diagnosed with prostate cancer will not die from it. At least 140,000 of them will not die from it, and it's probably higher than that. Okay, well, well depending on how you look, let's just say 140,000. Most guys eventually get prostate cancer, uh, you know, like I said, on the autopsies, 50 to 70 percent of them, depending on what you read, have it. And it'll be some low-grade thing. They die from something else. That's what you want, to die from something else. Who cares if you have low-grade prostate cancer? It doesn't matter um, in a sense here. So Ornish uh, took, Dr. Ornish, for his study, took 93 men who had decided that they did not want any conventional therapy in terms of they did not want surgery or radiation therapy or chemotherapy at the time of their diagnosis. These were low-grade uh, prostate cancer patients. They chose watchful waiting, you know, follow up with PSAs. Some places they'll follow up with uh, random biopsies. Dr. Ornis randomized his population and had a control group. So this is, you know, a pretty advanced fancy study, randomized control trial of one group having intensive lifestyle management with vegetarian diet, meditation and yoga for stress reduction, walking 30 minutes a day, 
So that was the treatment group. And then there was a control group that just went along with standard watchful waiting, you know, follow-up PSAs and biopsies, for example. His control group had a significant number of patients, excuse me, the control group had a significant number of patients whose PSA increased. Overall, the average increase was only about 6%. So it's not that big of an increase, but still they trended upward. Trending upward means, you know, you're more likely to need to go on to surgery, have the prostate removed, prostatectomy or radiation of the prostate, for example. In Dr. Ornish's treatment group, the ones on the vegetarian diet, also walking 30 minutes a day, doing the stress reduction stuff, they all kept their PSAs stable or even decreased their PAs. On average, the PSAs went down about 4%, which again is a pretty small number, but they're not going up. And if they're not going up, they're staying stable or going down, that means you can continue watchful waiting. You don't need to get your prostate taken out. It's no fun getting a prostate taken out. That's a pretty private area. Nobody wants that taken out. Okay. They also took the blood um, from both patients and they poured it on top of a tissue culture of cancer, prostate cancer cells growing. And there was a much more ability of the vegetarian diet eating person to have their blood slow down the growth of the cancer cells. So that was encouraging and consistent with what they were seeing in the PSA scores. Okay, so a little bit on the rationale. And this was, a, by the way, a landmark study. Um, I got the reference, I think, at the end of this paper. Uh, Low-grade prostate cancer, in general, is a slow-growing tumor. Um, we've known from the work of T. Colin Campbell and his great book, The China Study, you want to avoid animal protein. Animal protein is a tumor promoter for numerous reasons. Increased leucine, activates mTOR, increased methionine, essential amino acid for, for uh, cancer, increased casein, that's known to be uh, increase the rate of cancer growth, um, elevates uh, insulin-like growth factor, also, meat comes packaged in saturated fat, which is associated with obesity. Increased obesity, the fat has increased aromatase enzyme to convert testosterone into estrogen. Increased estrogen is associated with increased prostate cancer. So, you know, meat's a disaster for a prostate cancer patient. You don't want to eat one more bite. You're done. No more meat the rest of your life, okay? Now, a lot of people that don't know anything about medicine and health, they're going to tell you everything in moderation or I eat a little fish and chicken instead of beef. No, no meat, not one bite. And you can say, well, you know, you can do whatever you want. I'm just saying, if you want good results, if you want to live longer, be healthier, um, the smart move is never again take one more bite of meat, including not a sip of dairy or any dairy. All right. Vegetarian foods provide better blood flow to the tissues, more oxygen to the tissues. Better oxygenation of tissues helps decrease the likelihood of cancer growth, according to the Varberg experiments. Okay. The plant-based foods are more alkaline. Also, he had the patients exercise and walking at least 30 minutes a day. You get the lymphatic flow moving around, which means the white blood cells are more able to travel throughout the body and helps them to remove cancer, okay? The immune system functions better when a person exercises. If you look at some people who've made incredible recoveries from cancer, you're going to see that's very often. I've studied that in quite some detail. I can tell you, people who exercise a lot, they do better. They're more physically fit. They've got more cardiovascular reserve. Their immune systems are working better. It's a big plus. Um, I've known patients with metastatic cancer went out and started running marathons, as crazy as that sounds, and they actually did well. Um, all right, uh, meditation and yoga are two examples of stress management. There's multiple other ways a person can reduce their stress, their social support system, and, and that's another topic, but that's part of it. Because when you lower your stress, you lower your cortisol. Cortisol impairs immune system function, raises blood lipids, so you want that lowered. Prostate cancer is strongly influenced by diet, also by lifestyle and environment. And we know that because there's tremendously different uh, incidences. The disease is super common in the United States. It's quite rare in some of these other uh, less industrialized plant-based communities, especially in the past. You know, because you can take a country like China back in the 1970s, not that much industrialization. Everybody's eating a rice diet. Prostate cancer is very low. Now that they're starting to eat more of a westernized diet, prostate cancer is going up in uh, China and Japan and any country that adopts sort of a high fat, high meat, high processed food type diet. But the point being is you know that this is not some genetic thing because it changes so rapidly and it changes with migration studies. You take a Japanese person eating old fashioned rice in Japan, very low prostate cancer. But they move to Hawaii, start eating more meat and oils and processed food, more prostate cancer. Then they move to the States and they start eating a lot more of the same stuff, more prostate cancer.
Okay, some of the risk factors for prostate cancer. All meat is bad. All meat increases cancer risk. The fat causes rouleau of the red blood cells, hypoxia from that. Sat fat impairs mitochondrial function and skeletal muscle, leading to insulin resistance, leading to hyperglycemia. And the whole insulin being elevated, it's mitogenic, meaning it causes cells to divide, increase cancer risk. Most common saturated fats, palmitic acid, C16 with no double bonds because it's uh, sat fat, saturated fat. At, that activates CD36 receptors on cancer cells. Sometimes there'll be an amplified number of CD36 receptors on those cells. So the palmitic acid makes them grow faster. The choline from eggs and the carnitine from meat are thought to increase the cancer risk, you know, through the whole bad gut bacteria, make TMA. TMA goes through the portal vein to the liver. Liver converts it to TMAO, oxidizes the trimethylamine, the trimethylamine oxidase, and um, you get increased atherosclerosis and hypoxia. Vegetable cooking oils are, are big time tumor promoters. Uh, Dr. Nathan, I mean, not he's not a doctor, Nathan Pritikin wrote a legacy book. It's available at the mcdougall.com website where he summarized extensive analysis of the medical literature up to his time. The book was published in about 1988. It's his legacy, you know, posthumous. Um, and you know, he went through an incredibly large number of studies. And what he basically showed is that in the 1960s, there was a big push to reduce saturated fat after all the work of Ansel Keys and whatnot. And then there was the idea to substitute the sat fat with unsaturated fat, especially all these cooking oils. And that was a thing like substituting margarine for butter and also a lot of cooking oils like corn oil, for example. It turns out uh, Pritikin, by going through all the literature, said all these uh, cooking oils, they increase the risk of cancer. They increase the risk of atherosclerosis. So they really had no advantage over the saturated fat. You want to avoid oils. I recommend not one drop, just like Esselstyn. I agree with him. And Dr. McDougall agrees. Not one drop of oil. The more you read about oil, the worse it gets. And I can tell you, if, if you're curious about the outcomes from eating oils, take a look at the Pritikin work. He did a meticulous, brilliant, concise summary of it. And Pritikin had a cool quote. He said, he said some people downplay the, the significance of synthesizing the literature. He says, look at Watson and Crick when they found the structure of uh, DNA. They were just synthesizing the work that had already been done from multiple other areas. So it's a valuable thing. Okay, high blood cholesterol levels increases cancer risk. Simple sugars, because they get converted to fat. When I say simple sugars, I'm talking about sucrose, industrial fructose, like in an energy drink or something, high fructose corn syrup, honey. Fructose in a fruit is different than industrial fructose. You know, in a fruit, you got a lot of fiber, antioxidants, and other nutrients in there, a lot of potassium, versus like in some type of sweetened beverage. It's just the fructose coming in as a bolus to the liver. It enters glycolysis at the halfway point with the three carbon second half of glycolysis, and it just gets made into fat largely because the liver has nothing else to do with it. So it leads to increased saturated fat production, increased blood lipids. Sucrose is, is like 50-50 um, uh, glucose and fructose. So it's a lot of fructose, again, coming in as a bolus with no fiber to slow down the absorption rate. All right, obesity, you know, we talked about that. The fatter you are, the more estrogen you make. Diabetes have high insulin levels in the blood, some mitogen, um, and also by increasing blood viscosity, increases tissue hypoxia, things that increase tissue hypoxia, again, based on the Warburg experiments, et cetera, increases cancer growth. Tobacco, you know, it's totally stupid. Uh, tobacco, there's carbon monoxide in there as well as the nicotine's a stimulant, which is bad for multiple reasons in blood pressure, but the carbon monoxide in a cigarette also causes hypoxia of the tissue, okay? Um, the male prostate is like the female breast. We talked about any estrogenic chemicals. We've got lots of other lectures on estrogenic chemicals. You want to avoid them. Definitely at least have a carbon filter on your water. And then avoid all these other sources of it. Like I said, plenty of other lectures and books on that. Omega-3 fish oil is thought to increase the risk of prostate cancer, according to the research of Theodore Brasky and the Select trial. You can look that up if you like. Um, got a separate lecture on that. Lack of male ejaculations. When a male has sex or ejaculates more often, there's a little bit lowering of the risk of prostate cancer. Okay, um, now I'm going to tell you what I do. So I gave you a background on the big picture of prostate cancer, uh, screening for prostate cancer with PSA checks, diagnostic workup, staging, and some of the treatment options. Um, what I do personally is I I've read tons of stuff about prostate cancer and risk reduction, and basically you'll see it over and over and over again, paper after paper after paper. Persons who eat meat and oil, high levels of cancer. And you'll see it in all the epidemiology studies. On the other hand, persons who eat a vegan diet with lots of plant foods and no animal foods and no oils, they have really low, so minimal that it, it's, there's no point in screening. When your risk of a disease is so low that 
it'd be incredibly unlikely to diagnose this type of cancer. Then there's no point in screening. And because there's no point in screening, you don't have to worry about it. And that's the best way to be. That's how you win the game of health. Now, I know almost nobody is willing to do this. The number of people who are 100% vegan is like, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's maybe one in 500, if that much. Um, it's incredibly low. And I also know from, I talked to lots of doctors and lots of people who are not doctors. And I'm not sure off the top of my head, I mean, I can, if any of them are 100% vegan, I'm 100% vegan. Not one bite of a meat product, not one drop of oil, no sweets, no caffeine, no oils, no nuts. And the reason I don't eat nuts is because I got a lot of fat. I'll have a, like like one tablespoonful maybe every couple of months maybe or a special event, but I, I really almost never eat them. Um, no avocados because they're so fat. And you say, well, why do you do this? And I go, because I want to be healthy. I like being healthy. I'm 58. I have my nephews wrestling on high school. I'm coaching them in wrestling. I still wrestle with them. I lift weights every week doing squats. I can go up 50 flights of stairs without breaking a sweat. Compared to all the other doctors of my age, I think I'm aging the best out of them except this one guy who does triathlons. He works out a lot more than me. I spend more time reading. I should be working out more. Um, he's a little younger than me too. But anyways, avoid unnecessary stress. Um, try to get along with the people in your life. Just keeps life simple. You know, Whenever I deal with somebody who's rude or obnoxious, I just you know try to be polite, get it over with briefly. They got to live with themselves. So I don't take things too personal. My mind's thinking about something. I don't really care about some transient interaction. Um, strong sense of purpose. If you know who you are, what you're trying to accomplish in this world, whatever it might be, to help your family, to help some career goal or whatever, it just gives you a strength to know who you are and what you are and what you're trying to do. And that helps make you more resilient. Okay. Um, if you take your identity and your purpose from what's around you, you know, you become kind of floating every day and you're more prone to losing that sense of purpose that pops you out of bed in the morning, gets you ready to try to do something useful. All right, the bottom line is reduce your pretest probability of prostate and other cancers, and then you don't need to screen. I don't want to know what my PSA is. I could care less. I know I'm about as low a risk as any man my age in the entire world, so why would I want to check a test where with a, such a low pretest probability, I'm far more likely to have a false positive and potentially get trapped into some unnecessary workup that I don't want, have the stress of worrying about it, okay? My total cholesterol is 93, LDL 53, triglycerides 85. So, you know, I got a lower risk than a Japanese guy back in 1957, okay? It's not even funny. So that's what you want. That's how you win the game of health, okay? And you're going to talk to all these stupid people who are going to tell you, oh, I believe everything in moderation. Instead of beef, I eat fish and chicken. You know, they don't know anything. person who talks that way is somebody who doesn't know anything about nutrition and cancer risk. You look at the smartest doctors. Look at McDougal. Look at other ones who've really studied this. They're going to tell you this. Zero animal products. Zero oil. You know, health knowledge is not like social knowledge, go with the flow, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Health knowledge is, I'm only going to do things that are good for me, and I'm going to avoid anything that's bad for me. You should view animal foods as poisons. Don't go near them, okay? Cancer and animal foods, they go together, and oil's the same thing. Um, and I believe that, from what I've read, you really want to minimize your dietary intake of fat. Increased total fat of any kind increases cancer risk, okay? Um, I don't like so excess sodium because it's a vasoconstrictor. It decreases blood flow. What did Varberg say? When you decrease blood flow, making tissue hypoxic, you increase cancer risk. So I don't want to do anything. I want to optimize blood flow all the time. All right, so that's basically how you can win the game. Because the same diet that prevents dramatically lowers your risk of prostate cancer, it dramatically lowers your risk of myocardial infarction, it dramatically lowers your risk of diabetes, of hypertension, of stroke, of impotence, of all that stuff you don't want. They're all kind of almost like manifestations of the same condition. A high fat diet and a high animal protein diet pushing a body towards rapid replication of cells, which also pushes you towards the Hayflick limit and accelerated aging. Okay, so that was kind of the climax of this talk, that last slide, showing you how you can win this game. You don't always have to be a pawn and a chump who gets all these terrible diseases and needs to get all cut up and take all these difficult medicines. That's what most people do. They're clueless and they always end up all sick and they don't age well and it's a big disaster. But I'm letting you know there is a way to win this game. You just have to be willing to do it. And the way you're willing to do it is if you understand. Now some people say, oh, well, I love, you know, this food. It's so good. Yeah, it's probably because it's got MSG in it, okay? Use your brain. 
All right, we know enough about fat being bad. <laughs> the biggest thing you learn from Nathan Pritigan, he'll summarize, you know, tons of studies. You'll, you'll read, you know, 200 pages in a row of studies summarizing how bad fat is, making everything hypoxic, causing diabetes, cancer, arthritis, you name it. Um, he was obsessed with that, and he was absolutely right on the money. And the guy is a genius, Nathan Pritigan. Okay, anyways, we talked about it causing diabetes, increased cancer risk, increasing the bowel salts in your colon. Fat is bad. I don't think there's any good fats, by the way. Even omega-3s are associated with increased risk of prostate cancer. Look at the work of Theodore Brasky, and there's other studies that will suggest that as well. Um, and then you can't be too low in, in fat. You know, Pritikin said there's no such thing as a fat deficient, and I would add natural diet. And the Winnett studies uh, showing that you could feed people less than 1% fat. Um, it was an omega-6 linoleic acid, and they did well. Oh, one other thing, too, is I eat more raw food than I, than I used to. Um, because I think that when people talk about the high carcinogenicity of some of these fats, including omega-6 oils, a lot of that was vegetable oils that are cooked and highly processed, whereby the, the fats are distorted. So you want a minimum amount of fat, and you like to get that from a natural source, just from regular fruits and vegetables, uncooked. So it comes in natural rather than post-processed in an oil and, and cooked, which is going to change it. Okay. And here, look at this quote from Nathan Pritikin. He says, one bowl of oatmeal, just 100 grams, will provide enough linoleic acid, omega-6, to meet all your fat needs, to meet your fat needs. And he's probably basing that on the Winnett studies and the McKean studies where they fed people, like I said, total fat, only 0.7% of their diet, metabolically defined uh, diets. Okay, simple sugars are bad. We talked about that because they end up leading to increased lipids. Starch is the best because it takes a lot of time for your gut to peel the fiber off the glucose. And starch is a polymer of glucose. It's not the same as sucrose. Sucrose is fructose and glucose. Think of uh, glucose as being the thing your brain wants, your body wants to burn that glucose. It is pretty much just about almost always a very good thing, okay? Fructose, it depends. It's good in fruits. You gotta be careful not to eat too much of them. Like sometimes I think even you gotta be careful they don't spray waxy MSG on some of these apples. Cause I notice I sometimes eat these apples and they're so good. I find myself eating seven apples like that. And I'm like, I didn't remember apples used to taste that good. Okay, like seven in a row taste that good. I heard they can potentially spray MSG on the waxy coating. And I try to wash it off as best I could, but I'm like, why do I like these apples so much? And the only way for me to avoid those apples is not have them in the house, okay? All right, so. Tons and tons of studies have shown fruits and vegetables lower cancer risk, all cancer risks, uh, you know, tons of different cancers, colon cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, pancreas cancer, you name it. They're alkaline, they're low in protein. A lot of acid comes from protein because protein contains them, is made out of amino acids. They're low in the bad amino acids, leucine and methionine. They're low in fat. Um, they're high in potassium, vasodilator, more blood flow, more oxygen to tissue. They're high in magnesium, more uh, vasodilator, like potassium. Magnesium and potassium go together. Um, nitrates and vegetables, good vasodilator. That's why Caldwell Esselstyn, the Mr. Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, recommends his patients eat lots and lots of greens. Okay, uh, other phytonutrients. We don't even know the name of a lot of the nutrients, but our bodies are designed for those things. Cruciferous vegetables, they inhibit mTOR, the pathway that's like a nutrient sensing pathway that promotes cell replication, so you want to inhibit it. Blueberries inhibit it also. Cruciferous vegetables it means things like broccoli, cabbage, um, cauliflower. Um, the plants also got the antioxidants in them, which also help maintain the integrity of DNA so it's not damaged and mutated. They're low in iron, which is good. You don't want the heme meat iron because that increases oxidative stress, which can damage DNA. We're almost done here. Just a couple little points here. Uh, starches are good. Like we said, they're the best food to get the vast majority of calories for energy. A couple things I wondered about. Beans are high in protein, about 25% protein, which is quite high for a plant food. It's like one of the highest you'll ever see in a plant food versus a meat are very often like 50% protein. Okay. But the beans tend to be low in methionine. But if I had cancer, I would probably reduce my intake of beans because that scares me. I would probably, I would still eat some but I would, it would definitely wouldn't be as big a staple of my diet if I was really worried about lowering my protein intake. Um, I would also minimize my fat intake. Oatmeal is about 16% fat. Quinoa in the ballpark of 14% fat, which is a little high on the fat side for grains. 
grains tend to be a little bit acidic, not bad, but it's also been shown in a lot of studies. I read a whole bunch of studies that grains and beans were associated with less risk of cancer um, and better outcomes in cancer patients. So having a healthy diet and exercising and having some form of stress reduction, they're all part of optimizing outcomes in cancer patients. You know, there's a lot to it, but those are key things. And preventing, I want to prevent cancer. You don't want to get cancer. Um, and, oh, and secondarily, when I say prevent cancer, I mean prevent clinically significant cancer. You can't completely prevent cancer. Everybody's got cancer cells in their body. You just keep your immune system healthy and functional so that it suppresses the cancer, doesn't let it grow. And that's what you want. Um, the best starch, I think, is potatoes. Sweet potatoes are essentially equal to potatoes in my mind. Rice is equal quality of a food by itself, but there's the arsenic issue, which we've talked about in other lectures. Carrots are good. Beans are good, except a little high in protein, as we spoke about. Grains are good, but a little acidic, moderately high in protein. Um, be careful that the grains are old and moldy. They can get this zea, which is a, it's like zea alone, something like that, the pronunciation of it. The point being is it's this estrogen that grows in the mold. So if you see uh, grains that look old, don't eat them. Uh, patients on a very low fat, moderately high fiber diet, you know, they just get better outcomes. Patient and social support groups get better outcomes. They help lower each other's stress, you know. Uh, they get that sense of belonging and acceptance that makes a person healthier. Um, some case reports of patients doing well with the macrobiotic diet. Um, this guy, Gordon Sachs, did several studies. The first one for four months, the second one for 14 months. He took men who had a biochemical recurrence of prostate cancer. Biochemical recurrence means they took out their prostate. Initially, they thought they were cured of prostate cancer, but then their PSA started going up, suggesting that there was a metastatic component to the disease outside of the prostate. Metastasis means outside of the site of origin. And so that's called a biochemical recurrence of prostate carcinoma. And these patients, he gave them this uh, plant-based diet. He also did stress reduction as part of his uh, therapy. And they had increased survival. It slowed down the rate of doubling time. A significant amount, you know, from 6.5 months to 17.7 in one group. And in the six-month study, even longer, from 12 months to 112 months. So that's pretty incredible results. I got the reference to these at the end of this uh, lecture here. I'll have a slide with that. Okay, I just wanted to show you some foods to get a sense of like looking at foods. Look at this. Look at these meats here. 45% fat. This is absolute crap. This is give yourself cancer food. Okay, 55% protein. Animal protein and animal fat, they're both carcinogenic. You don't want to touch any of this stuff. Stay away from it. Look at these numbers. Look at this salmon. 50-50. You know, these are terrible foods. Run. Be afraid. Okay, look at potato. 1% of calories from fat. That's low fat, okay? Like we said, people do fine on that. And people have been putting metabolic wards for six months and only eating potatoes. They come out feeling better than ever. All right, protein, really low, only 8% protein. Incredibly low numbers, all right? And you want high carbohydrates. You want high complex carbohydrates, all right? I think potatoes is the best food in the world, potatoes and sweet potatoes. Rice was up there, but, you know, here we're looking at white rice here. Uh, only 1% fat. It's about 7% protein. That's good. Okay, and fruits tend to be incredibly low in protein. Look at apples, 1% protein. You know, bananas, blueberries, 4%. That's really low number of calories coming from protein. That's good. The protein's where all the amino acids are, more acidity. Um, in particular, though, the amino acid composition of a plant food tends to be quite different than an animal food. The animal food's got more methionine, more leucine, more lysine, all things that are thought to increase cancer risk. Um, but still, I'm making the point that these are really good food. Now, here's the problem with nuts. A lot of nuts have incredibly high amounts of fat, and I don't want all that fat. The exception would be probably chestnuts have much lower fat, but you don't need them, okay? Now, here's just a little bit of additional information because people will sometimes ask, well, how can you get enough essential fatty acids? Your uh, essential fats are your omega-3 uh, linolenic acid and your omega-6 linoleic acid. And the point I'm making is they're in plant foods. That's where the fish gets them from. So if you eat the plant foods, you'll get them. You get more than enough. You don't need the supplement for them, okay? Um, and that's also the why I do eat raw food, though. I, I think it's, it's I, I don't want to only eat cooked starch, okay? You know, some people will say, oh, you can eat as much as 90% of your calories. Yeah, well, you know what? You should also eat some raw foods. And never the vegetable oils. And again, the vegetable oils are worse what I'm trying to say is omega-6, I think, has gotten a worse reputation than it deserves because a lot of the research testing omega-6s was done with oils where the thing was already processed and it distorts the structure of it. 
versus the small amount of omega-6s, omega-3s and plant foods are more than enough for what we need and coming from a raw plant food um, they keep you healthy and a lot of some of the best looking healthiest elderly people I've ever seen they will swear by eating a lot of raw fruits and vegetables and look at um, Ruth Hydrich, the incredible marathoner lady who recovered from breast cancer. She eats tons of raw foods. Look at Annette Larkin, you know, the most beautiful grandma in the world, okay? She eats tons of raw food. And I, I, I'm, as I read about it, I think there's a reason why you want to make sure you get that salad every day and some fruit, other fruits and vegetables because there's good things about it. Okay, and here's just a summary of some of the references from this uh, lecture here. Um, Ten-year outcomes, you know, again, that refers to a lot of the low-risk patients doing quite well no matter what. Um, so there's no point in being aggressively treating a real low-risk cancer if the guy's, you know, going to die of something else in the next 10 or 15 years. Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers is a good book by Mark Schultz, MD, and Ralph Blum uh, just from this past year. So it's quite up-to-date. It's like a, you know, it's been a revised edition, so it's quite up-to-date. It's good. Um, then multiple papers comparing the prostate cancer patients depending on their treatment, watchful waiting, um, some stuff about the effects of diet and exercise, um, the WINIT study summarizing how people can do just fine on 0.7% uh, calories from fat, the McKean study, the same thing, um, a little bit about like Varberg type data on how hypoxia increases cancer risk. With hypoxia, a cell either dies immediately, infarct, dies slowly, apoptosis, or becomes cancer, okay? Uh, so hypoxia, bad. That's why you always want good blood flow to all your tissues, which means the plant diet, okay? And stress reduction, all right? The Undo It book by Dean Ornish, quite good. That's also pretty recent, 2019. Here's the big famous Ornish paper, 2005, Intensive Lifestyle Changes and How They May Affect the Progression of Prostate Cancer, landmark study. Um, we've talked about it plenty of times. Everybody who studied these things knows prostate, the male prostate is like the female breast in terms of hormonal sensitivities. Um, some other studies about, you know, the benefits of a vegan diet and the risk reduction and whatnot are listed here as well. So anyways, I hope that's helpful for you. And like I said, what I see as a key point in this is the way to win the game is make your risk so low. You don't even need to check your PSA. And that's what I, in my experience, the absolutely best, smartest doctors, that's what they do. Okay. If a person can't handle that, and I know 99 point something percent of people can't handle that, um, at least do this other stuff and that'll improve your uh, prognosis. So good luck to you. Make sure you talk to your doctors and learn from them and you read a lot and you watch the videos and you get yourself educated.